Welcome to Innovating from the Middle Space of Community Change. My name is Liz Weaver, and I'm the co-CEO of the Tamarack Institute. I'm excited for our conversation today about leadership, uncertainty, and innovation in the community change space. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our guest speaker, Gary Nelson. And I'll give you a little bit of Gary's background. So Gary Nelson is the Director of uh, Social Entrepreneurship and Innovation at the Jordan Institute for Families at the University of North Carolina School of Social Work at Chapel Hill. He's also the Thomas Willis Lambeth Distinguished Chair of Public Policy. His areas of interest and expertise include leadership development, large system and community engagement change methods, social innovation, social entrepreneurship, and sustainable development as they enhance de democratic self-governing systems and contribute to the solving of complex, wicked problems in society. Welcome, Gary. Thank you very much, Liz. It's great to be here. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and your leadership experience? Okay, thank you very much. Um, as Liz indicated, I currently direct what's called the Social Innovation and Entrepreneurship Lab at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill in School of Social Work. And prior to getting into social work, um, I actually grew up out west, you know, in the state of Idaho, not so far from Canada there, and went from there to Chicago, where I, I worked on the south side of Chicago with a poverty law group before I went on to graduate school. And so I decided to change my the weather and go from Chicago and I did my graduate work at Berkeley, where I focused on large system change and then went from there to the University of Hawaii and then from there to UNC Chapel Hill and I've been here for some time. So I say that by way of giving you some context, I my involvement in kind of policy issues and efforts to make change um, begins really in the early 1970s, you know, and that is, a, I think, a critical time in this country in particular, uh, then is a time when much of what was called the impetus of the, the liberal welfare state really uh, ran into a wall in the 1970s and um, large scale universal kind of change stopped efforts at healthcare, income, early childhood intervention, really ran up against a, a political wall then. So skip forward almost 50 years, um, I've been working in areas as complex as child welfare, behavioral health, around issues of poverty, um, with issues of what's happening to older adults and in communities you know, with an eye to the university perspective, being able to combine research, engagement and education to try to affect large system change. And I must say that over the last several decades, I think we've made very little progress. You know, so I began to, to reflect on why that was the case and to think about the, the nature of the problems we face, you know, differently. That they're really complex problems that really haven't um, lent themselves well to the kind of um, categorical uh, silver bullet fixes that we often use to try to address problems that if we're to be successful, it would take um, a multi-dimensional disciplinary community effort to be able to affect any kind of change. And so that, that you know, kind of moved me into uh, work in community. And so in the mid nineties, uh, developed a, a dialogic method for bringing communities together around the outcomes that they wanted. And it was called self-governance in communities and families. And it looks a lot like what we now call collective impact, uh, but it basically had many of the same kind of tenets. And there was a notion there that in working with the child welfare system, that if we create a space for community, for the system to actually to think differently about what they're doing and to think about how they could secure outcomes, that collective process of pooling interest uh, really proved to be effective. So out of that, I kind of moved to doing work in sustainable development. And in that developed the, the concept of, of the middle space. And if you see the, 
there's a figure on the paper that many of you may have uh, around integrative leadership and innovating for the middle space, and it shows an individual jumping between two ledges. If I were to do that figure differently, I would have that person kind of hang in the middle there with the the parachute kind of above them, with the idea that that I think what we find now is that whether or not we're talking about perspectives on the left or on the right, is those perspectives, that kind of duality, no longer serves as well and has become very conflictual if we're going to be able to come up with solutions that have impact, it will involve integrating perspectives from very different uh, lens, you know, from, you know, getting from the, the right and left, as well as different disciplines that no one political position or no one discipline has the answer to what we're facing now in the way of complex problems. So it's in this middle space that we see an opportunity to uh, birth solutions that are not one plus one, but they're really a function of combining differently these different perspectives to have one plus one become three, something totally new and -hmm. something emergent. And so that's kind of informed my work, you know, since the late 90s into 2000, moving from child welfare to moving to then sustainable development, and then began some work going from community kind of system change process to developing a leadership program with a colleague at Duke University for the World Bank. And they had come to us, you know, um, with a request that they found that even though they had some very technically smart individuals who went to the best schools, who are economists and, you know, hard science individuals, gone to the London School of Economics, that they found that time and again they failed and where they were failing was on engagement, you know, with the, the host countries. And so they asked us to come up with a process to help them think differently about their work in the World Bank. And out of that, we developed a, a leadership methodology that, help them think differently, they integrate different perspectives. So we went from that, that kind of leadership work and then we went to, again, back to working with communities around different areas. Now we're somewhat belatedly um, focusing again in this country or beginning to focus again in this country on, on poverty. So I'll, I'll just kind of close there in saying that um, before we kind of move forward is that the, the notion of integrative leadership and why it's happening now is a function of our traditional approaches not working. Categorical thinking or disciplinary thinking uh, in and of itself is not effective. In many ways, I think our social science model of being able to break everything into parts, you know, that now we find our world very much broken into parts and people have fallen out of relationship with each other. And so we're moving to I think a new way of thinking about how do we get back into relationship with each other? How do we uh, embrace difference? You know, how do we embrace conflict uh, for the purpose of learning from it to fashion solutions that none of us presently have? So that's kind of what led me to this notion of integrative thinking and integrative leadership and a movie, working for the middle space. It's really interesting because, you know, um, I think your background, you know, the, the being engaged in a whole bunch of movements kind of in your education and then kind of bridging that into some of the work you've done, you know, both at the university but at, at multiple universities really does give a, a kind of unique perspective to all of this. And, you know, one of the things I think about, Gary, is how do we as community leaders or community practitioners engage with the university more intentionally around these kinds of questions. And so that's what's really intrigued me about um, this webinar today. So I'm going to move on to our next question, which is, um, how is leadership affected by uncertainty? And how can we begin to think differently about um, the leadership as we try to navigate it? And I think you, you, you kind of teased us a little bit with your introduction around that. But I wonder if you might be able to go a little bit deeper um, on that question. Okay. Um, so the the way I can think about it is that 
leadership is very much um, a product of context and changing context. You know, and that includes political and social and economic kind of context. And so we now are thinking, beginning to think about leadership differently because we're largely being forced to, because again, what we've done in the past has not worked. The kind of systems, the kind of command and control systems we developed in what I would call the administrative state are failing us. So again, context is important. And I, I would just say the way I look at it is that what's presently going on around the world and certainly in the United States um, is a function of longer waves of, of development and change. You know, I would say in the, um, these waves run about 80 to every 100 years where we are now in the deep winter of an earlier era about how to solve problems. And there's a certain entropy kind of setting in is that the traditional ways of solving problems are again, a failing. So we're, we're being pushed by context to think differently. Um, in many ways, I think leadership is uh, oddly a function also of followership, meaning that the public and the, the, the experience of the public has changed significantly that they're demanding something different. And so often I think it's leaders who are sensitive to that respond to that and attempt to shape something in response to that context in the public to be able to, quote, get out in front. You know, so I think we're, we're seeing the kind of collapse of what I would call the administrative state. And, and I think it's as large as, um, you know, when Arnold Toynbee, you know, philosopher, wrote about the collapses of states, is basically a collapse of the moral center of a state and country, and we certainly are seeing that in the United States. You know, that comp that kind of collapse, and when elites fall out of touch and out of relationship with the public, you know, I think we see that in the United States, that elites, irrespective of the party, are under challenge in this country and internationally. So that, that kind of tumult, you know, creates a lot of uncertainty you know, a, a lot of fear on the part of people. And um, Alex de Tocqueville, who wrote about democracy, said that people in general, and, and America's made in particular, have two competing passions at times of great anxiety and fear. And one is to be free, and the other is, is and to lead, and the other is to follow. You know, so the risk is, in terms of populism, is that people will be compliant and follow, uh, when, whereas others will be challenged to step up and to lead if we're to maintain some of our freedom. So those competing forces are at play largely because um, the center, how, how we thought about facts and what we thought was true is no longer holding and there's a process of kind of breaking up. And so we're in a bit of a scramble. So all over this country, you see, you know, in every city across the United States and perhaps also in Canada and internationally, you see a, a outbreak of uh, attempts at innovation. And it's the natural response of a system that is failing is to try to experiment its way to a new order to reestablish some balance between freedom and order and to restabilize the culture and the, the politics. So I think we're li living in a period of great um, anxiety and uncertainty, you know, which is classically um, both an opportunity and a, a real threat. But it's an opportunity to, and this is where I think community comes in, is that when in our country, when the the federal government is a loss for what to do, or people don't agree with it, or state government is then change moves to the community where people know each other. And there's a beginning kind of invigoration of community uh, in the United States, I think, in a way that I hadn't seen for a long time. And I think that's positive, which speaks to a lot of the focus on collective impact or just large kind of collaborative efforts kind of coming together. So. I think we're being driven to innovation. Um, and as you, all of you probably know, in terms of when you think about innovation, there 
there are two classes of innovation. And one is that you get up earlier and you stay later and you try to improve upon what you've always done and you get a little bit of an incremental bump. And the other is more transformative or disruptive innovation. And I'm one of those who believes we're moving toward a, an inflection point you know, where we're going to see tremendous disruptive, if not already disruptive, innovation if we're going to right this ship. So I think integrative leadership speaks to that because, as I said earlier, I think our culture in this country in particular of narrow, self-interested individualism means that we have fallen out of relationship with each other, you know, whether or not it's in families or in communities or between citizens and politicians, that people are increasingly out of relationship and feeling isolated, which I think leads to a lot of our, the violence in this country that the people, when they feel under threat, they often act out with violence, you know, to attempt to assert some sense of order. So our focus now and kind of then how do we work with community to bring together people of goodwill, you know, from different perspectives, uh, different disciplines, different parties, urban, rural, you know, to begin to fashion a new kind of moral compass, you know, and culture and out of that culture, you know, new institutions to be able to, to stabilize and rebalance the kind of order we have. So that's, that's kind of a long-winded, you know, dis description of, of what I think is driving the outbreak and innovation in this country. It's really interesting because, you know, it is, a, like, as you mentioned, it is very contextual, and yet there are these larger trends that um, we have to observe, and I think you've been really, it, it, it's been very useful for you to set out those kinds of trends. I think in Canada as well, we're seeing some of those trends um, also impacting some of you know how uh, Canadians are responding in um, in a whole bunch of different ways. So let's move on to the next question, which is really the heart of the matter. Um, what is uh, integrative leadership, and how have you been thinking about it, um, and thinking about how it can help us uh, it, even innovate better than you know we are maybe innovating at this point? So I think. Integrative leadership is, in some ways, it's also a def definition of innovation. There's um, a work, you know, by an individual who is Brian Arthur, who's been associated with the Santa Fe Institute, and has written a lot about complexity, he's an economist, and he writes about the, the nature of, of technology. And what he would say is that, that the way technology works, and you can think of technology as your iPhone, you know, which is a concrete expression, but you can also think of technology as a as a methodology like collective impact, or you can think of, of technology also as in the design of institutions or cities. You know, so technology is not just an instrument, but it's how we get things done. And so what he would argue is that what has always driven innovation is purpose and intention. And so the, the question becomes then to look at the kind of technology we have now is try to understand the, the purpose and intention behind it. And for what we would call integrative leadership is to ask the question then if we're bringing communities together to solve complex problems, you know, from poverty to child abuse to opioids or high rates of violence, you know, what is our intention? Um, how do we think we'll solve that? And that intention then informs the, the design of our, our methods to make that happen. So as I said earlier, I think um, our social sciences or our, our approach to change has um, become very unbalanced, you know, and we're facing what we call asymmetrical challenges where we find individuals who are impacted by all these changes actually have very little felt or perceived power 
to deal with larger forces and trends or to deal with uh, the power of the, the state or public interventions or, or the private market. So in the face of that, then we have to think very differently about then if you have limited power is how do you grow power? So in the States, I would say a lot of what we develop for others, meaning not generally for ourselves, you know, I would include myself in this in terms of university faculty. I'm a privileged individual. I'm upper middle class. And so when we talk about social interventions for others, we're talking about people without power. And so I think what we find oddly is that our approaches to dealing with people without power and others, while they had said the intention was to help them, and in fact, I think what has happened unwittingly is we have fragmented uh, those very communities and systems and families that we have sought to help. We have broken them into parts with the idea that we could take them in with our expertise, tinker with them, fix them, and then put them back in the community and see how they would work. And that hasn't played out very well. You know, Mary Parker Follett, who wrote about leadership, would say when you're looking at this kind of process, you're talking about power over people as opposed to power with people. Integrative leadership and it brings together, and at the center of the process, those impacted with others in the community in a collaborative process is at its heart a process of trying to rebalance that proposition. And in that rebalance to, to grow power for those who are, who are out of power to help them ensure that, you know, whether that's jobs or solving problems, that you're gonna level the playing field so they, they have voice and agency in the solution. Our expert driven and top down model has really disrupted that and has made, I think, many families into more clients than citizens. And so to rebalance that, we have to talk about a kind of a, what I would say is a blended and balanced proposition. And in that, I'll say, you know, one preference to the notion of a, a balanced um, and blended proposition of leadership, an integrated leadership model has to do with how we have thought about leadership and management. So when I think about leadership and management for the purposes of growing power, it's a difference between doing the right thing and doing the thing right. And the, the change is that when I talk about management, you know, the shift to an integrated leadership is not to manage the other, but is actually to, to manage myself you know, and, and my choice is to, to make sure that I create space for others to step up and to lead and make their contribution and to have power and voice as opposed to, I think we've had a kind of a hierarchical notion of their leaders who tell us which way to go and then we have managers to manage everybody below them. And I think that's been at the price of their, their own voice and agency. So leadership and management in the notion of self-governance is a, the idea where you don't manage others, you first manage yourself to make sure you model the kinds of behaviors that you are leading with and say they're right for others because people will follow by example. So that's what I mean by kind of a, a blended value proposition. It's, it's interesting to me. I'm just going to jump in here, Gary. It, if you look at the image that we have on the screen, you're changing the point of the fulcrum, right, to balance yeah. the power. And it, it is interesting to me, it, in managing yourself, it's about creating the space for others to be in conversation with you. Right. If you have the power, not taking all the space, but really creating that space for uh, co-design and co-dialogue and to really get to the, the more root of the challenge or the wicked problem that you're trying to solve. Yeah, I, I just as a follow along with that, in that image you see on one side, you have these three stones, you know, piled up and then at the other end of that, that fulcrum there, you have one stone, but it's balanced. And I think part of that speaks to the idea that 
we underestimate the, the power of agency and will and values. We overestimate the, the power of, of material things, of money. And so often we find that, I think, for others that unwittingly people risk giving their power away by giving away their agency and their voice. And that's a function of intangibles and not necessarily just how much money you have yet. In this country, when we get together and when we bring community together, and the first thing we ask them was, what do they need? You know, and they would say more money. And our experience has been that in where we've seen really effective kind of change, you know, that it hasn't been about money. It's really been about, again, that, that sense of, of voice and agency and leveling the conversation and creating a space for that kind of dialogue, you know, to find common ground. So um, the, the next question that we have uh, is really about the guiding principles uh, around this. And so are there some guiding principles that you've identified that can help us apply uh, integrative leadership? Yeah, very much. And what I want to do is in, in talking about that is to, you know, take you back to uh, one of our efforts around a, a leadership program. And in that, in the figure that many of you see there, at the center of that is intention and purpose. So the example I want to use is when we developed this leadership program for the World Bank, is we brought people for a week. They were in transition from one assignment to another, an individual going from being country director in Russia to becoming head of human development in India. And so they had a week in transition, so they came to this program at Carolina and Duke University that we had developed for them that was a model of kind of integrated leadership. And when they came, these were individuals who were also often economists, is they would, they would say they came because what they needed is more technical knowledge, more kind of hard knowledge about how to make change happen. And we would set up opportunities for them to get that, you know, so they could learn about India and human development and the country and economics there. But we also set up in that week that they're with us a series of sessions that I led that had to do with purpose and intention and had them go through a series of reflections. And so in that figure, you see the purpose and intention is we would engage individuals in one-on-one -on -one kind of conversations about why they came to the World Bank in the first place, you know, what they hoped to accomplish when they're there and what values were important to them. And by doing that, we were tapping into their, their sense and maybe sometimes forgotten kind of altruism about why they came to work there in the first place and it kind of reminded them of the intangibles that are so important for most of us, you know, about why they were doing this work. And we would engage them on the basis of that. And they would, we would then ask them for this week they were going to spend with us what success would look like. So it was not engaging others with kind of, we have the, an evidence-based intervention for you and your community to fix you, or we have answers, but we have questions about what's meaningful to you, uh, what motivates you, what would success look like to kind of establish that as a starting point. And based on that, we would then move to facilitate a process by which they would then begin to think about and kind of design, you know, what they want to see happen in their, their next assignment. So in that design process, it, then it was folks, it was informed by this sense of the outcomes they're trying to achieve, the kind of sex they were gonna have. And there are two elements, and obviously I'm, I'm simplifying, you know, what went on. The two elements that really kind of stand out is the, the work of William McDonough would say that, you know, that intention is design. So having reminded them of their original intention of, 
And what they meant by success was is very value driven and very outcome driven is taking them back to that kind of memory of that and then looking at and asking them to tell us a time, you know, in their professional life or might even be in their personal life when they had been successful against all the odds, you know, it could have been really gone wrong. You know, they could have gone over the waterfall, over the cliff, but they managed to pull themselves back and make something successful happen. And in that, they would tell a story, you know, about that time. And we would ask questions about what were you thinking? Who was there? What did you do? What other people do? And what we found was that, um, and we developed kind of a saying, is that people know better than they often do. That in anybody's life, there has been a moment of, maybe several moments, if we're lucky, of success against the odds. And the lessons that we can learn from are really in their experience, in those lessons. So we would help them unpack that to help them understand when they were really, really good, what accounted for that, you know, so that they could take that and bring back that kind of memory, unpack it, learn from it. Our belief was that it's not my just my eldest daughter, if she asked me you know, what to do about something. She's not asking me to tell her what to do. She's asking me to listen, you know, and ask her what kind of purpose or end she wants to achieve and gives her a moment to kind of reflect about that from her own experience. And she's much more likely to believe her experience than if I were to say, and what you need to do is this, because we find there's evidence for this, you know, that if you just do this in context. And so that really kind of shaped and we, their thinking and we would have them actually create a, a mind map then that would kind of lay out what that looked like when they were successful and create an alternate mind map of kind of what they were now doing and be able to put those side by side and see you know being able to kind of reflect on their their their, their own kind of leadership and when it worked and what it didn't and being able to then to craft a, a plan going forward so that would lead to the next part which is then having a design to move forward and in the figure if you see that you know that when we move from having some kind of plan to doing something about it we always say and then stuff happens meaning you might have a design but when you put it into play a lot of things happen because it's very complicated there may not be the resources and you have to be able to adapt and learn in process so it's a very participatory you know, experimental, but driven by kind of a, a framework of the design and driven more by principles than the technical what you need to do. And when stuff happens, the ability to kind of learn and adapt, to deal with authority and power and be able to move forward, to be able to then evaluate and adapt once again. So it becomes kind of a cyclic process of constantly kind of integrating within our own experience and then bringing others together. Obviously, when all of us know that if you think about when we've been successful, it's generally because it's been a product of many other contributions, you know, in our lives and, and the work we do. And it makes us more cognizant of that. There's very little we accomplish on our own. It's off in relationship with others, with different perspectives. And so it's that kind of reminder of self and others going forward. So that becomes the kind of circular regenerative process uh, of integrating these different perspectives what we call the integrated leadership model. It's really interesting um, to see the model here. And, and, and it, it seems to me that, you know, um, some of it you could apply just even in your own context, right? To think about, you know, things that have happened in your own practice where something has been really successful and what were the elements of that or where something has failed and, you know, what can you figure are the elements of failure? So you identified some guiding principles, and we have probably about um, eight more minutes before we go to uh, questions from the audience. So do you want to walk us through those guiding principles, Gary? So this, yeah, this principle, is, again, is that the center of this, pro it, this process, this learning process, if you will, adaptive learning process, is to be very cognizant of our own intention and purpose, you know, and to be sure that the way design is consonant with that purpose, and we engage others on the basis of that that purpose. 
So it goes from tension purpose to engagement to then inform design uh, of what we want to accomplish. But with a stop and kind of looking at often what gets in the way of the future is our own kind of um, path dependence, our own kind of habits, our own kind of mindset. So it's not necessarily what's in front of you, you have to change, but it also makes you reflect on some assumptions and some things I've been doing that don't work and modeling my willingness to change myself and my perspective based on the bringing diverse perspectives together as opposed to my, I'm here to change you, you know, is my willingness to change myself. The next one is then the, the kind of participate learning by learning by doing, you know, and being totally comfortable with then stuff happens. It, plans seldom go as planned, but they're driven by principles and being able to kind of adapt and still stay with those principles. And the final part is this kind of notion of adaptive self-evaluation and change, that this all from intention and purpose is a very self-organized process and a very principle-led process as opposed to a more technical process. We can increasingly Google technical, we can bring technical expertise, but the how of integrative leadership is very much around what some people in the past called soft skills and what we would now simply call complex skills of working with others effectively. Um, the final question that I have for you, Gary, is um, what um, what are the challenges of trying to implement uh, an in integrative leadership approach? So what what have you seen with uh, the folks that you've worked with or community folks um, in terms of taking this on, taking being much more reflective in your practice and, and really, you know, creating space for others? OK, so thanks. So I'll go back to a question you had about so we're I'm in a university so in a university we would often say you know that out there in the rest of the world there are these problems and these inconsistencies this kind of categorical fragmented thinking without actually taking stock and kind of looking within the university we are as fragmented and as categorical in the university as the world outside of itself we're part of a common culture yet we oftentimes don't own our own fragmentation. So it's often a push for I'm in a school of social work to think about going across campus and engaging people from the, the school of business or going to public health or going to different disciplines, you know, to kind of model this kind of integrative thinking and learn from different perspectives. We tend to stay in our silos, yet we will often talk about the community being siloed um, and not take responsibility for that we actually were the architects in terms of change management of creating a very siloed kind of world. So I would say that's that kind of mindset is probably the biggest barrier is to, to take responsibility for our own contribution for what some people say is kind of holding the problem in place. Another is that um, just the, the over-reliance on, on technical solutions and kind of top-down expert management and undervaluing different forms of knowledge you know, that are different than technical knowledge, you know, but are revaluing the impact of values and purpose and intention is, is also very impactful knowledge, uh, valuing the, the expertise of the very families we're trying to help with the community and kind of leveling that. So for the university that Often, if you say for, we're from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, and we're here to help you, that often doesn't install a lot of confidence in communities. But if we say we're here also to learn from you, to engage you about what you're trying to accomplish, and to say we know a little bit, but we don't know as much as people give us credit for. We know some things, but not others. And it really takes that pooling of that expertise. So I think that's Learning some humility, you know, has been, a, or the absence of humility has been a big barrier for, I think, academia and working effectively with communities. Hmm. That's really interesting. Um, if you have any questions for those folks that are on the line and have been listening in, please do um, post them in the question box. We're now going to open it up um, to our question and answer uh, section. Duncan, do we have any questions? Yeah, for sure, Liz. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, the, 
the first question we have actually relates to this, uh, the point you just brought up, Gary, about overvaluing technical knowledge uh, and, and the, the importance of actually engaging with the families and people that um, we're supposed to be serving. Um, why do you feel that there's a hesitancy to actually engage or ask questions of or empower those that we're serving? And does that relate to your early, earlier point about people being hesitant to give up their power? Yeah, so I think, you know, and we're talking about that a lot here in the university or in the school I'm in. And I think it, our culture, in many ways, academia, has incentivized people to, in some ways, become more removed from community and to exaggerate the value of what we know. So in many ways, I think we bought our own press, you know, and overestimated how much we know, and then in the process of undervaluing others that, you know, if the idea is that somehow we're a meritocracy, um, for anybody who's done community work, you full well know that when you're in community and dealing with people from different walks of life, that they're all different kinds of um, smarts, and intelligence and expertise, you know, that no one system has a corner on that. So I think, you know, um, I think universities over time had in this in this country had been disengaged and now going through a process of trying to re-engage with community in a, in a way and listen to what communities identify as those problems they want to solve and how they want to solve them is they want to solve them in partnership. They don't want to be talked down to. You know, they don't want to be disrespected. You know, they want their contributions respected. And as individuals who learn many different things. And, and here I want to say something about, you know, I want to find in terms of the middle space when in this middle space, it's not data and technical solutions that meet in the middle that really kind of give us a different perspective is when people of different walks of life and expertise come together and experience and share experience and, sh and share felt knowledge. That's when experience meets experience as opposed to just ideas and data. You know, that that's what really I think drives change is a sharing of, of different experiences as well as knowledge. But leading with that, that tends to, I think, to help level the playing field that all of us go home at night as members of families and communities. And in that sense, we share a, a common challenge, you know, and it's kind of leading from that, that common um, position, you know, kind of leveling the, the power differential in the room. It's interesting because at Tamarack we say uh, often no stories without data and no data without stories, right? And so it, it is that kind of, you need both to be able to kind of understand things. Duncan, do we have any more questions? Yeah, I think we just have time for, for one final question. And it's actually a, a sort of a follow-up to, to what we just discussed here. Uh, but it relates to how to approach that, that intersection of, of different people and perspectives without seeming too authoritative, how can we be more vulnerable in a system where vulnerability isn't necessarily encouraged when in fact sometimes the opposite is encouraged to, to kind of overrate how much we know and what we can bring to the table? Yeah, I think it's, it's, it's a really good kind of question. And I guess part of it that I think about in response to that is thinking about, so what do we have to lose by simply engaging somebody on the basis of, of sharing that we have common questions, we have common interests, but we don't know the answers. We do know that it'll take the pooling of different experiences and forms of knowledge. So it's always struck me, so what is just letting go of the idea that, that we have to know that we have to be in control and let go of that control and ask ourselves, what do we have by, to lose by doing that? Not much. We have much more to gain because people can lean into the conversation then 
and share their kind of perspectives and we'll find ourselves richer for that. So it's, you know, backing off less telling you about what I know and what I think you should do and more about kind of asking you what's important to you, what you know, what's important to me and find that, that middle space. How can we then pool each of what we know to create something that's greater than the two of us? It's really interesting to think about how do we get to this middle space that we have um, between us um, and how do we, I think the question that was just asked about being vulnerable is, is a big challenge when we're paid to be decision makers, right? And you mentioned that earlier, Gary, I think, you know, um, uh, our jobs often call us to make these all these decisions in real time and then to go into this with the intention of not necessarily knowing seems a little bit kind of counter countercultural to how we are um, how we're paid or how we receive you know uh, um, uh, kind of yeah, position I, and that kind of thing you know so it is it is really interesting to consider all of this so well, um, oh go ahead yeah so just one thought on that you know is that I think we actually do know the answer to that, you know, for us in positions of power. So in this country, myself and other people like me get a lot of subsidies from the government. We get, you know, a lot of what people call welfare. But the kind of support I get from the government gives me the right to choose. It, it gives me the right to build assets. It gives me the, the right, you know, to be able to look into the future and plan for the future, what we give for others who don't have power is the absence of choice, the inability to build assets, and a difficulty to look in the future because the very incentives and the kind of controls we have over them makes it impossible to sometimes look beyond the weak. So just as economic development is designed and created is very much that poverty is equally designed and created. You know, so I think we know if we were to apply the rules to apply to us for our benefits and support from the state and the incentives, you know, we'd find that if it works for us, you know, the question would be then why don't we use the same kind of incentives, you know, and choice to make that available to others who now don't have power and choice in exchange for accountability. So we now have a system that we have the questions and the answers, you know, from the, the top, and then we wonder why things don't change. So the switch would be more freedom in exchange for accountability, among others, but freedom for them working with supports and working with community and working with experts to find those solutions, but to put them in the driver's seat in just the same way that all the benefits we get, I get, I'm in the driver's seat. And I think that's a really, um, I think that's a really thought provoking, but also a realistic approach and a, a real important thing to kind of take something that we take as for granted and say, okay, so how do we change this so that the playing field is, is balanced, that we're changing the fulcrum um, in the balance. Okay, so looking at the time, this brings us to the end of our discussion. Uh, thanks, Gary. This has been like Thank you much. so so interesting to listen to and to um, think about uh, what you've um, laid out for us in terms of innovating from this middle space and what it takes to truly step into the leadership role in that middle space. And so I. I, I want to thank you for that, but also thank the folks who joined us on the call today and the questions that you've posed. But we just have a couple of final announcements, so I think I'll turn it over to you, Duncan, to lead us through the final announcement. Uh, the one announcement we have for today is about the Community Change Festival, and it's the Tamarack Learning Center's marquee event for the year, and it's taking place September 30th to October 3rd, uh, 2019 in Vancouver, B.C., uh, the event features a keynote address from George A. on how power and privilege impacts community change. And you'll be able to join changemakers from near and far to deepen your knowledge of the five practice areas needed to move your community change agenda 
from idea to action to impact. Um, you'll leave with practical tools and resources on things like collective impact, community engagement, collaborative leadership, community innovation, and evaluation, as well as uh, numerous immersive city learning experiences and opportunities for peer learning. Uh, one thing I really enjoyed about last year's uh, CCF was just the, the focus on these different practice areas and how they all connect to empower us to, to create community change. Uh, Liz, is there something in particular that you're excited for this year's Community Change Festival? Yeah, I think um, building on the webinar that we had today, we're really going to explore more deeply this notion of collaborative leadership. And I think, Gary, if you'll give us permission, spend a bit of time exploring this idea of leading from the middle space and bring that into our collaborative leadership discussion. Because I do think, you know, one of the things that we know at Tamarack is that context is really important and complexity is critical. And so this middle space kind of leadership, this integrative leadership is really um, uh, important for us to think about and to build into our collaborative leadership practice. And so I'm going to give it some more thought and then we'll see this, uh, see some of the ideas from this webinar um, appear at the Community Change Festival as well in our conversations. Mm -hmm. And again, the opportunities for peer learning at the Community Change Festival are really exciting. We already have registrants from across Canada, the US, as well as Australia. So you really do get a global perspective on community change work. Uh, once again, thank you everyone for joining us and thanks to you, Gary, yes. for, for sharing your wisdom with us.